this seminar, UCL Energy Institute. Uh, I'm Paul Eakins at this institute and also director of the Institute of Sustainable Resources, which is the sister institute. And there is no topic that uh, demonstrates the overlap between energy and sustainable resources more than the topic that we're going to hear about tonight on bioenergy. And there's no better person in the UK, and I might say even internationally, than Gail Taylor to talk to us about it. She is a professor at the University of Southampton, Director of Research for Biological Sciences, co-chair of the university-wide energy group there. She's been working on bioenergy since 1990, which makes her a serious early adopter. And that was when her first PhD student started to uh, look at forestry and modeling and predicting bioenergy crops. She's published over 120 peer-reviewed papers, which is more than me, on bioenergy and allied topics. Uh, her research on bioenergy extends from the molecular to the landscape scale. And she's worked on the water footprint of bioenergy crop. I've had the pleasure of working with her in the UK Energy Research Centre on the spatial mapping of feedstock resources. And she's principal investigator of a project <coughs> called Carbo Biocrop, which is intended to quantify the carbon footprint of bioenergy feedstocks. Very, very necessary. Our energy systems model in the Energy Institute assumes that bioenergy has a zero carbon footprint, which it clearly doesn't. So we need work like that to enable us to get our numbers better. I could go on, but I'm not going to, because you come here to this game. Not I just really like you to ask you to welcome her, uh, and we are looking forward to what you've got to say. Thank you very much. Thanks for the splendid introduction and thanks to you for coming in this awful rainstorm, so uh, well done for being here. I'd like to talk to you today about bioenergy and I should probably start by saying quite a bit of my research has been funded by the Natural Environment Research Council over the last few years, so I should acknowledge them. My natural habitat is this place here, it's the Institute for Life Sciences at the University of Southampton. It's a new £45 million building, which is quite honestly the worst place I've ever worked, but that would be a different seminar, so uh, on to better things. So I could have entitled this seminar Get, Getting More From Less. How can we do that in a world where natural resources are limited? We're limited for water, for food and for energy and we know that will be exacerbated as population uh, increases. And, and it's really a question of how we're going to tackle that and how bioenergy fits into the story. But bioenergy, it's a great idea renewable energy from biological sources. <coughs> These things I've been working on since 1990, green plants, they're more or less the only things that can take the energy of the sun and convert it into complex chemical energy. So sugars, starches and, and the woody matter that we call lignocellulosics. And not only that, there's a whole vast array of green plants that can do this. So from the first generation crops, the food crops, things like maize, one of the three staples globally, oilseed rape or wheat or sugar beet, in temperate environments, in tro tropical environments, we, we might go to sugar cane or other oily crops. Then these things we call second generation crops, which have no uh, role in the food chain. And then even more exotic things, green algae, single cell algae or seaweeds that can uh, harness the energy of the sun in marine and um, uh, freshwater environments. So it has to be a good idea, surely, that, that we can harness this vast resource. In fact, of the 13 billion hectares of land globally, we only use around 10% in cultivated systems, uh, largely for, for arable and for pasture. So surely we can grab a few, a few more percentage points to use for bioenergy. It, it doesn't seem like a bad idea. Oh, no, uh, 
be seen. I, whoops. <coughs> I think what's happened here. Next, let's have a look. And of course, on top of that, um, green plants are unusual in that they can be used in a variety of bioenergy chains, things that you're all familiar with. So from uh, production of biomethane through to heat and power or to transport fuel, all of these routes exist from these various feedstocks. So it's all looking great and promising. But we all know, of course, that's created huge problems over the last 10 years or so. And this is largely to do with uh, land and using energy for land. We, we, need to use energy, uh, we need to use land for food and using land for, for energy and food has a water consequence. And so we see that this is where some of the controversy has arisen. So, for example, top priority greenhouse gases. Are these energy systems, these bioenergy systems, really low carbon? In fact, some recent research has suggested that the carbon footprint of bioenergy can be even worse than fossil fuel chains, depending on how it's deployed. What about land? Uh, we, we've seen that some unsuitable land has been used for these crops. Oil, oil palm plantations where tropical rainforests have been destroyed. And that, of course, is um, an issue. Ecosystem services, so wider impacts than just on greenhouse gas balance. Ecosystem services, the goods and services that we all acquire from ecosystems, can be impacted rather negatively by bioenergy. And you can't read this down here, but it actually claims that 30 million people are starving <coughs> as a direct re result of biofuels. Well, that looks like a Daily Mail headline, so I must be more careful about where I take my quotes from. But it highlights the point that these are extremely controversial land uses that we need to be questioning. Oh dear, let's see. Mm. I'm getting on very well here. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, displacing food crops, the food versus fuel debate, and this thing called indirect land use change. So ultimately, if we grow an energy crop, it may not displace a food crop directly, but in time, it may displace an important food chain. And so this has led to a, a big global effort in developing sustainability criteria. And this is really where we're at now, trying to define these good and bad bioenergy change that chains. The policy arena is pretty complicated, and currently Europe is in a bit of a stalemate that we are waiting to move forward with some European legislation. So there's been a large pullback on these technology systems because we're not really sure about some of these wider environmental consequences. So <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about policy in any detail, but most of the policies are moving towards these three principles that we have to try to address in some way. The first is that probably we need to intensify bioenergy crops and bioenergy systems. We need to optimise yield and so that we can use land more effectively. And you may have come across this concept of um, sustainable intensification. And this may help us avoid conflicts with food. As Paul noted, bioenergy crops have to have a better greenhouse gas balance than other land uses, and particularly better than equivalent fossil fuel chains. And they should have no negative impacts on wide ecosystem services. So these are the, the guiding principles. And I'd like to have a look at each of these in a, a UK context for the rest of this seminar. But do we really need to use land at all for energy, why don't we just use land for food? That would be the sensible thing. <coughs> well, there have been several UK and global reports, for example, the UK Bioenergy Strategy recently, the special report to the IPCC, which underpinned the recent mitigation um, uh, report from IPCC, a technology innovation report for the UK, and finally, Committee on Climate Change. And all of these are, are coming out with a very similar message, that bioenergy systems could effectively be deployed to supply 10 to 20 percent of primary energy requirements in future. And for the UK, these four sustainability principles have been identified. Greenhouse gases, savings have to be genuine. That's a harder question to address than we, we may initially um, consider. 
they have to be cost effective they have to compete in the marketplace with other uses of the land again not as easy as it looks benefits have to be optimized and these global risks must be minimized particularly water wide ecosystem services equity poverty and biodiversity so um, it's a good idea but there are lots of caveats and um, policy can lead to uh, unforeseen consequences. So in this new, new world of bioenergy, what are the sorts of um, systems that we might be deploying in future? Well, this is a roadmap that was developed in Europe from 2005 up to 2030. And it starts off here with those first generation food crops. These were the things that were first deployed. So maize in the USA to produce bioethanol for example, oilseed rape in Europe to produce biodiesel. And um, the feeling is that this is now a mature technology and it's likely to grow much more in the future because the greenhouse gas footprint of these is not competitive with a number of other systems. But as we move along this curve, we can see that residues and wastes come to be very important. And then these dedicated lignocellulosic crops so um, uh, sometime in the, to the future these will be deployed commercially we hope and then later on these third generation bioalgal systems will come into play and these are really to address some transport fuels where systems where only liquid fuel can perform um, the task so for example aviation fuel and so this is the, the roadmap on which we're moving along. And so here, we're seeing that there's a movement towards these non-food crops. What are they? Well, they're perennial trees and grasses in temperate environments. And they might be things like Jotropha in the tropics. And so we can see if we look at the UK um, bioenergy strategy, a little bit out of date now, but over the last few years, it was projected that we had a requirement for around 3 million tonnes of this lignocellulosic woody biomass, that the energy output would be here, and that um, in the, the, the UK Energy uh, White Paper, it was observed that using biomass for heat and power was one of the most cost-effective and environmentally uh, sensitive ways to, to, to decarbonize society. But we can see if we look at the predictions moving forward that the actual amount of biomass going up to 30 million tonnes here and way beyond that it is ramping up very, very significantly. And, and as, indeed, as I said, this is quite out of date and that Drax, the largest coal burning power station in Europe, is currently utilizing several million tons per year of biomass resource to co-fire um, with coal. And so this can have quite extreme consequences. And some of you may be aware of this debate that's been going on in the Financial Times over the last couple of weeks. So just a couple of weeks ago, um, a group of 50 eminent ecosystem scientists in the USA have written to Davy and the DEC chief scientist to say that our current policy of importing uh, pellets from the US, largely to co-fire power stations such as Drax, is not environmentally sustainable, that uh, it has impacts for climate, um, carbon and forests in the US, and uh, it's a very strongly worded letter with 50 co-signatures requesting that um, this is reconsidered at the earliest um, convenience of, of the UK government. And so largely we have a lot of imports at the moment and it's been estimated that this will be up to 80% of our requirement will be could be met by pellets in the future being imported and clearly that's hardly that may or may not be sustainable and so there is still a big move to look at the UK resource and to try to use that in an optimal way and to see how much of the UK could be effective for developing these non-food bioenergy crops. So what might a non-food bioenergy crop look like in a UK context? Well here's one, this is a fast growing tree, it grows roots very quickly, you can see here and produces woody biomass very quickly. So this is just a piece of wood which has been uh, rooted in this way. 
Uh, some of these bioenergy crops are some of the fastest growing temperate crops. Uh, this is poplar, willow is another, and a large grass that you may have heard of called miscanthus, which is imported from Asia. So it's an Asian grass which is now being grown in the UK. So they're fast growing perennial crops which produce a lot of this stuff, biomass. What do we need to do to them? Well, we need to improve them in all sorts of ways, but I'll just point out a few. They need to have reduced greenhouse gas emissions. We know that's important. And they need to have this intensification um, of, of yield. So more yield per unit um, land area. So uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later. I'd like to start though by unpacking a little bit of this greenhouse gas footprint because this is critical. If we have bioenergy crops, which have a, a greater carbon cost than fossil fuel chains, they're not sustainable. So we need to know what, uh, what this is all about. And of course, just to remind you, if we have a whole chain like this, we might have some trees here which get harvested. They are producing greenhouse gases. So for example, they will emit carbon dioxide in the process of respiration. They will pull down carbon dioxide in the process of photosynthesis. They'll emit uh, N2O from the soil and methane and, and other greenhouse gases. So we have the, the tree, the crop system here. And then there's also a carbon cost to transporting the crop. Uh, there's a cost depending on the efficiency and what the end use is. And we often term this the whole life cycle analysis of the system. And if you look at this for bioenergy systems, these numbers are being put into policy documents consistently. And they largely use what we call lookup tables for this part of the system. And this is where we have very, very little idea. Actually, very few empirical data which have been collected, particularly for the soil, to know what's going on here. So we got ourselves into a situation where policy was being developed from high-level LCAs, where these numbers down here were just, just really from models. They were not in the context of uh, these new crops, so we use crops, food crops to get the numbers, or forest, tall forest crops, and so this is where the big black box is, and so we need to understand what the real numbers are here. In the UK we address this through something called the Energy Technology Institute. We've had a three-year project where we've spent around four million pounds um, ETI is co-sponsored by some government departments, the research councils and six large companies who are very keen to have the answers to these, question, these questions related to the greenhouse gas balance of bioenergy crops. Uh, we've had a partnership with several university partners in the UK where our aim was to quantify the impacts of land use transitions to bioenergy on greenhouse gas balance. We wanted to validate models with real measurements and develop modelling um, tools that could be used in uh, the UK context. If you have a look at the literature, and we did this at the start of the project, on the actual numbers uh, that are around for these land use transitions, so from arable, grassland, so that's the sort of uh, semi-managed grassland we see a lot in the UK, or forest, converting to these bioenergy systems. So this one, SRC, short rotation coppice, a perennial grass, the miscanthus grass we've been talking about, first generation food crops, fast growing short rotation forestry, and um, other types of crop. If you see a black square here, it means that there's very little data and we don't really know what, what's going on. We can't make judgments. A green square means that the impacts are largely positive, a red that they're negative, and a, a blue that they're neutral. And this is for soil organic carbon, total carbon in the soil, and greenhouse gas fluxes, greenhouse gas balance. And the overriding thing here is that most of this table is black that we just don't have those answers. Scientists are developing them very fast, but at the moment we can't fill in this table. And just to give you um, a little example, so one example of how we're trying to address that gap, this particular transition, so from a grassland to an energy coppice, we've had a closer look at. <coughs> And um, so you can see that there are significant gaps and we, we want to have a look at these. So uh, these transitions then, um, 
what are we doing with our four million pounds? Well, we've set up a whole network of sites across the UK. In fact, these sites now make us one of the best nations in the world to address this issue of actually measuring greenhouse gas balance of these crops in land use transition. So we're looking at arable to willow SRC, arable to miscanthus at this site in Lincolnshire. In Scotland we have a couple of transitions that we're looking at relevant to Scotland in Wales and this site in Sussex here which is the one that we run from the University of Southampton we're looking at the transition from grass to willow short rotation coppice. So we want to unpack this entirely and find out what the carbon and the greenhouse gas footprint is. And so what we need to do is think about this system. So we have our coppice here. It has carbon stored in the shoot, carbon stored in the root, carbon stored in microbes, and then carbon that goes into these long-term pools in the soil. And sometimes that's called carbon sequestration. So we can sequester carbon long-term into the soil. And the system also loses greenhouse gases, as, as we've mentioned previously, from the soil. And also this exchange between the atmosphere is going on continuously. So respired CO2 is lost and photosynthesis is gained. And so we have to deploy some fairly clever technology to try to get a handle on that. So we use something called eddy covariance. Well, we look at packets of air moving across the canopy and we make uh, 10 measurements per second of what the airflow is doing and at the same time we can measure the concentration of the gases and from these fluxes we can work out whether there's a net loss or a net gain of carbon so that's eddy covariance we can look at the soil so we actually deploy these chambers in the soil to measure all of these greenhouse gases we do standing assessments of the carbon from biomass measurements routinely. So we get a handle on what's happening in the system. And then we have these dynamic soil chambers which every few minutes they're opening and closing and we have them deployed with and without trees so we can get the different types of respiration in the system. At this site in Sussex we're also looking at the mitigation potential of biochar which some of you may have come across, this black carbon. So the idea that you can put uh, byproducts from pyrolysis into the soil, they're very carbon rich and they can lock up carbon. It's been estimated that about 12% of all greenhouse gas emissions could be locked up globally in this way. And we're actually testing that in this system. And we're also here doing something called soil metabarcoding and metagenomics. So we're addressing the idea of biodiversity. So we don't have to go out and catch and count things these days as biologists now. You just take a handful of soil from here and you run it through a DNA sequencer and miraculously we can get to know all the organisms which are in the soil. So we're assessing the diversity of these land uses too. So what can we see, uh, what's happening after um, that? Well, these are um, some data for five years after transition in that system. And we're comparing here a grassland, which is the pale green bar, and um, the willow short rotation copies bioenergy. And where you see um, any uh, number above this line here, that's a net release of greenhouse gas from the system. And we, we, we plot everything here in equivalents of carbon. So we convert all the greenhouse gases into carbon equivalents so we can look at them a bit more easily. So these are net releases and these are net drawdowns. And uh, for those of you who are ecologists, these are the main components of the carbon footprint. So we have gross primary productivity, the respiration of the ecosystem, and soil respiration. And then this is the really important one. This is the net of what happened. So in year five after conversion, the grassland, so this is a fairly unmanaged, rather typical Sussex downland. If those of you have read uh, Tess of the D'Urbervilles or other Thomas Hardy novels, this is the rolling Wessex type downland of those novels. Um, so this grassland is over the course of a season, it's net release, it's giving carbon back to the environment. And you can see here that the willow, the, the short rotation copies, the energy system, is pulling carbon down, so it's a net 
carbon sink, we call it, or a store. And we can imagine, we can explain that in various ways. There's a lot of standing biomass here. Uh, carbon's being put down into the soil and it's staying there. Whereas here we have a lot of uh, vegetation, some of it's rotting and respiring, and so the grass is, is net release. So for this particular system, we can say that after five years of conversion in the UK, um, this is improving the, um, the carbon footprint, the greenhouse gas footprint. The bioenergy system is a couple of um, tonnes per hectare per year improved relative to just having grassland where you graze sheep. So these are some of the data that we are now using t to model um, uh, more widely. And this is just another way of showing that. This is uh, hours of the day for the willow and the grass and this is our net ecosystem exchange again and this is month of the year and you can see here this is an actual visualization it's the fingerprint it's the drawdown of carbon into the willow system and you can see it's just not there in this grassland so the willow is is has a much better um, carbon footprint as I say, we've put these into some models, and I'll come back to these later, but we've developed a set of rules for land use changes that we should and should not engage in. And this was work that was funded by NELC. So never replace woodland with a bioenergy crop, because that will not be good. You will displace a lot of carbon. And that's, we'll, we'll come back to it later, but that's quite important. Uh, grassland shouldn't be replaced by these yearly annual crops such as oilseed rape. And then SRC and miscanthus, well if you replace arable, we actually see an improvement. SRC and miscanthus on grassland, we just saw that's okay, it's just about beneficial over the lifetime of the crop. And uh, obviously if you are using oilseed rape for bio, biofuel, it's, it's neutral on arable, but we'll come back to those in a moment, but we're beginning to put some numbers onto uh, these land use transitions. I also mentioned the intensification of yield and how we can use the landscape more effectively. And this is also very, very important. I've got some data here, therefore, yields that have been actually measured in um, bioenergy poplar trees and you can see here this scale and you can see that um, in temperate experimental systems it's not that unusual to be able to get 30 tons per hectare per year from these types of systems. Now if we go down in the UK we're actually if you look at actual commercial yields we're down here usually less than 10 10 tonnes per hectare per year and a lot of the government modelling is at around 15 so these systems just don't work unless we're up to these yields. This, this thing here is what we call the yield gap. So we have big biological potential which isn't being released in a commercial scale and we can discuss the reasons for this. Um, these, these crops are largely unbred, the food crops that we all eat every day have been bred and selected, they've been genetically modified in a very long-term way over thousands of years and these uh, crops we have not benefited from that improvement. And one possibility is that modern biology can make a step change to address this yield gap and it's how we go about achieving that that's the real question. And I can pose a couple of solutions to you today that you might want to consider. How can we increase yield and yield intensity? That's a pressing question. We haven't solved it yet. Um, some of the work that's been going on in the UK is that we need a model, and we've developed a model which we, be we began working on in the 1990s. This was a tall forest stand model. Uh, it's a process-based model which has various inputs that describe yield, and this has been improved. I, I won't. I won't go into the geeky details because unless you're a geeky modeler probably you won't be very interested but just to say that since about 1994 when we started trying to improve this model we've been trying to re-parameterize it to describe accurately a bioenergy short rotation coppice crop and these are some of the steps and if you're interested this model takes various biophysical factors and it generates some outputs and 
the one that we're interested in is down here. It's oven dried tons per hectare per year. So it's raw yield that we need. And we need a model to be able to work with how we improve these yields. And we validated the model. We published this just at the end of last year after about 15 years of work. And you can see here that um, these are trials yields for uh, a number of trials in different areas of the UK, which were run by Forest Research. So from cool, moist sites to warm, dry, and warm, moist, and cool, dry. And we have trial yields, and this is the yield which is predicted from our model. So you can see it's pretty good. So we have a model that works. It's great. It predicts coppice bioenergy yields quite effectively and so we've been working with that model just recently and what we did is we looked at every uh, one kilometer grid square in the whole of the UK and I know very well that there are, there are about 300,000 of them so we can imagine that in every kilometer squared of the UK we can do a model run and predict yield so you have around 300,000 runs for every time you want to make a yield map like this so we've been working with the Software Sustainability Institute and we now have this running on the supercomputer at um, the University of Southampton. It's cut the model, model run time from around 48 hours down to two hours, so that's really nice. And we can generate these yield maps. So here's a nice yield map for short rotation copies. And you can see that the green bits are where this particular um, type of coppice is yielding more highly, so over towards the west. And what we've done is we've worked with collaborators and we've looked at the UK climate change uh, data. So here we've got some temperature changes that are occurring up to 2050 and rainfall and we've looked at carbon dioxide and we're trying to use these uh, predicted climates to find out where and when and what we can grow in the UK that might be sustainable for lignocellulosics. So we've looked at miscanthus using a process-based model. We've looked at forest growth SRC, that can, that's our model that we can um, predict coppice. And we use this carbine model to predict short rotation forestry. We look at current climate, we look at climate change, and we look at the low, medium and high predictions for carbon dioxide. So these probabilistic um, climate change scenarios. We've looked at 10 scenarios and um, as Paul mentioned this is work that was funded by the UK Energy Research Centre over the last few years and it's beginning to tell us the answers to some of these yield questions. Here's an example of uh, the sorts of output that we might get. It looks at a whole range of non-food bioenergy crops which might be sustainable and which will um, prevent some of these imports from the, the USA of pellets. So miscanthus, short rotation copies willow, poplar. This is short rotation forestry poplar, which I'm pointing out deliberately. And then lots of other trees, alder, ash, sitka, birch. In general, these just fall out of the analysis. They just don't grow fast enough. They don't yield high enough. But this um, short rotation forestry poplar, you can see that these light green areas are very prevalent here. And it does seem to be generating the best uh, amount of biomass in this um, model. So uh, in general, short rotation forestry poplar is better than miscanthus, which is better than coppiced poplar, which is better than coppiced willow. So that's slightly odd. What's the difference between a short rotation forest and a coppice? Well, short rotation forestry is when you grow a tree a little bit like a tree at wide spacing. So four meter spacing, you let a tall forest grow for maybe 10 or 12 or 15 years and then you cut it. These coppice systems are where we cut the tree down to ground level and you have multiple stems appearing. And this is what the recommendation is for the UK at the moment. And we can see here that maybe that's the wrong thing, that we should be growing many more big tall trees because they yield better according to our model. And then we can look at areas of the UK and identify what's going to happen in future. So um, these are high, medium and low scenarios, but you can see yield is going to increase in the UK with climate change. So that's a good news message that we will have some better yields. However, these yields, this is about 8.5 tonnes per hectare per year. 
they're not going to increase a tremendous amount. In fact, the increases are really rather moderate in relation to climate change and they're not going to address that stepwise change that we need to make uh, in order to make this industry work a bit better. The other interesting thing about this figure is what we have here are the best crops in any given area. The black is what we call exclusion. We have um, uh, uh, layers that we use for our GIS mapping which excludes environmentally sensitive areas from the UK. So anywhere where there's a lot of carbon in the soil already, so that's a lot of peat up here, uh, SSIs, areas with nature conservation value and also high yield cropping areas we, we can exclude as well. But you can see there's a lot of red on this map and what that means is that uh, consistently this short rotation forestry tends to beat our other crops. So um, short rotation forestry is most suitable high yielding, yield increases are modest at best and we're beginning to identify areas of the UK where these bioenergy crops do particularly well if we exclude arable cropland. And we see that it tends to be the northwest and the southwest of England. We can then um, use these yield data with uh, a carbon model, a soil carbon model, and begin to make these greenhouse gap gas maps for the UK. And we've been doing that extensively over the last couple of years and it confirms those rules that we talked about before that some land use changes are just innately better for greenhouse gas balance than others and the ones that are better here we should focus on so replacing grass uh, and arable with SRC and miscanthus and never replacing woodland because it has a very high carbon value to the ecosystem so we've, we've come quite a long way in terms of greenhouse gases and indeed, um, these data now for yield and greenhouse gases are being fed into several modelling environments, um, including with ETI, they have something called the ESME, Energy Systems Modelling Environment. So these data are being used here, uh, alongside something called um, the Biomass Value Chain Model. They're being used by CCC and also in some of the deck modelling. So we're actually producing empirical data to um, validate models to develop um, future policy. I'm not going to talk today about things such as counterfactuals, but I'm happy to answer questions on those. Um, what about wide ecosystem services then? What, what's happening to the wide ecosystem? We've focused really on greenhouse gases and, and come up with some uh, interesting rules for conversion. But ecosystem services are these things that we all gain from ecosystems. And there are some here uh, provisioning services and uh, regulating services, a whole list of them. And our current work is trying to identify land use changes and where we see positive and where we see negative impacts and we've come up with this threat matrix that we're using at the moment this is the work of Rob Holland in my lab where anything green is is a positive impact of the, the land use change anything red is a negative and the, the darkness of the color tells us about the confidence so these dark green colors here ter tell us if we convert from arable to miscanthus or coppice or forests, there's a generally a positive effect in terms of ecosystem services. But as we move along the spectrum, the colours become paler and paler and they become pink and red. And so we have some real uncertainties out here for some of these transitions when we're considering a whole basket of ecosystem services. And um, our latest research, I'm not sure whether you can see this, is trying to map this. And uh, we can see that um, there are again areas of the southwest and northwest where for miscanthus and SRC we're beginning to see the biggest benefits for ecosystem services if we plant these crops. And allied to that we've actually done um, a some farm based modelling with Scottish agricultural crops and tried to identify where these crops can not only be grown in an environmentally acceptable way but economically they compete with other land uses at farm, at farm scale. And again, quite difficult to see here, but the southwest comes out again and a little bit in the northwest 
as being where there are the largest areas from the economic models that um, that these crops can be viable and I've got a flash up here but it's, I know it's going to disappear but I come back to it later but essentially it tells us that we can identify around 300,000 hectares where these two crops miscanthus and willow can be economically sustainable for the UK so as I say it disappears but it will come back later so um, what can we glean from all of that for the UK? How might we want to uh, develop the landscape in future? Now, I don't expect you to read all of this, but maybe you can see that this top picture here is, is a, a sort of standard arable field, which is intensive arable production. It's developing very few ecosystem services for us, um, but it's clearly producing quite a lot of food. And then, of course, we have the environmentally sensitive um, uh, managed arable systems with edges, improved for biodiversity and improved for ecosystem services. And similarly, we can look at the very intensively managed bioenergy systems. Many of these are in the northern USA, actually, which don't deliver many other wide ecosystem services. And down here, we're arguing in, a, in a, an opinion piece we wrote recently that there is scope across Europe to develop these more environmentally sensitive systems where um, these bioenergy crops can be grown in areas across Europe, such as the southwest of England, which are not prime areas for arable crops, which are currently underutilized for production, where we can have a positive impact on both ecosystem services and on the economy of local regions. So that's one answer to this question. We might be able to produce several million tons of biomass in an environmentally sensitive way that could help address um, reduced greenhouse gases for the UK. But are there other routes to address this problem? And one of the most controversial at the moment is genetic modification and whether this um, might be able to help. And this has received quite a lot of coverage um, over the last year or so. And in fact, the Prime Minister asked the government chief scientist to take a look at this uh, question um, about a, a year ago. And um, to do this, they went to the Council for Science and Technology, who did a report. And I'd, if anyone's interested in this, do go and read the report. It's fairly comprehensive. So it was a group of experts who got together to report to the Prime Minister on genetic modification. And um, it was really a concern that the regulation in Europe is out of step with the rest of the world. And it was to see whether or not that was um, judged as uh, um, acceptable. And this is one of the recommendations from the report that, um, that, the, that we should have confidence in the consensus from the experts that um, when properly controlled GM products are as safe as their conventional counterparts. So it was a tentative green light and there were some issues that um, it was uh, suggested that the EU particularly is over-regulated and that this might be considered in future. So there is potential that we can use uh, this technology. Can we use this technology for bioenergy? Does it have any role? Well, just to um, maybe remind you, this is the 2012, it's the hit parade for genetic modification and where it's being deployed globally. And uh, the first striking thing is that it's really being deployed everywhere and that Europe is an anomaly on the global map. But for example, you can see here in the USA, vast amount of crops are uh, utilizing GM. I think over 80% of soybean is, um, is GM now. And of course, that soybean feed ends up in most of the processed food that comes into the UK. And then there are some other countries down here which are growing vast amounts of um, GM. And you can see over here China and some new adopters um, in, in Australia and elsewhere. So uh, we are surrounded globally by this uh, GM technology. And of course, we can see, see um, some of the consequences of that in the UK. So just a few months ago, it was reported a rather 
uh, flimsy use of GM technology where we can change the colour of flowers. I'm not sure it's one of our most pressing requirements, but you know, we can do that. And down here, a slightly more serious use of GM where cassava is being fortified, so biofortification for developing countries. You may have heard of golden rice, but here is um, uh, cassava being um, enhanced with carotene, vitamin A, protein and iron and also uh, th so these are the GM and the wild type uh, these are also more disease resistant so this sort of technology does have massive potential and we shouldn't perhaps rule it out but what about in, in biofuel chains we said at the beginning that these lignocellulosic crops uh, should become commercial over the next decade or so and in fact believe it or not it may be may not be one of the most obvious uses of wood but getting liquid fuel from wood is uh, top on the research agenda and if we want to get uh, glucose we want to re get glucose release from wood and fermentation of this to produce ethanol bioethanol we have this rather difficult series of events so pretreatment of, of wood from the lignocellulosic resource it has to be hydrolyzed to glucose then it has to be fermented with microorganisms and then it has to produce ethanol and these these uh, processes require a lot of inputs they're bad for the environment we use chemicals I know we do some of this ourselves we had a project called energy poplar very strong acids to di make the cell wall the wood disassemble uh, lots of enzymes here and uh, um, here to ferment the glucose so um, microbes and enzymes so it's a pretty chemically intense uh, expensive process and this this part here this pretreatment getting the wood to disassemble is the biggest bottleneck in this system to producing bioethanol but we can produce bioethanol from woody material it's not particularly efficient but we can do it and there's a lot of work going on in that area at the moment so what about genetic modification well this is one example where GM has been used to great effect because um, oops, sorry in this system here this um, breakdown is really about um, making the lignin in the wood, which is a complex aromatic chemical, uh, fall apart, which releases the cellulose, which is lots of glucose molecules strung together. And these are some genetically modified trees here, which are being grown in both Belgium, currently in the field, and France. And these are the wild type, the normal trees, if you like. And these are two GM lines of, of the poplar wood. And um, as it happens, these are the lines here. If you take a cross section of the wood, and what, what these, these scientists have done in Belgium and France is they've downregulated the production of lignin in the wood. If you do that, one of the side effects is that the wood turns red because of the way the chemistry works. So this is just uh, quantifying that effect. And when they first did this uh, treatment, they thought that that might be the most important thing that they would discover and that it would become an ornamental tree. But someone then had the bright idea of saying, well, if we put this through a bioethanol treatment, something we call sacrification does this wood this GM wood produce bioethanol more easily and um, this is in field trial in both Belgium and um, France it was reported in PNAS a few weeks ago and this is the wild type um, tree in both of these trials and these are two of the GM lines and this is how much ethanol yield is being gained from that wood and you can see that downregulating lignin production synthesis in these trees has a massive impact on bioethanol production. So um, very large effects. At first, when, when we first, first did this, we thought it was going to be about 50% uplift in bioethanol production. But we can see that in one of these lines that's been developed in, by the French group, there's way over 100% improvement in bioethanol production from the same trees grown on the same land with just one gene that's been modified and of course these genes don't go into the food chain so these trees don't go into the food chain they don't flower because they're grown in short rotation copies so there's no genetic pollution as such 
So it might be one of the, the ways that GM can be used in a pretty sustainable manner. We're cutting down on the chemicals being used for processing and so um, and so the carbon footprint of these GM trees is much reduced. So they may provide another route to develop sustainable sources of liquid transport fuel. But of course at the moment they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be grown in Europe. Not because the regulations don't allow it. DEFRA would certainly allow a trial of these trees, but because um, uh, scientists and landowners and companies are wary of entering that very controversial area. But I'm sure this is one to watch because they're being trialed in other parts of the world, as you can imagine, and that will increase. So um, what can we conclude? Well, the promise of bioenergy for the UK. I hope I've shown you that um, bioenergy offers some potential. We will continue to import our feedstock if we want to ramp up in the way that policy is currently dictating. But we can currently grow um, over 300,000 hectares of this stuff um, in an environmentally sensitive and economically viable way. Are we doing that? No. But there are lots of reasons for that that we can discuss. The potential is still there. Land use is a critical issue, but the greenhouse gas balance of some of these systems looks reasonable and c considerably improved compared to farming systems for food. We've begun to identify areas of the UK which might be most useful, the southwest and the northwest. And I've posed another route for delivery, which is genetic modification and how that technology might be deployed in a sustainable way. And it just leaves me to thank a lot of my people from my lab, um, particularly Rob, Matt Tallis, and uh, Michael Wright. We collaborate with CEH um, on Elam with Pete Smith at Aberdeen, with UEA, with Neele Shah at Imperial College and funding from uh, these places. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks Gail. Nice to see how the room has filled up since uh, <laughs> the rain stopped. watching this. Um, terrific. Well, those of you who are regulars here will know that we're going to take some questions, have some discussion now, and then we'll do camp upstairs for some more, uh, for some refreshments and for um, some more informal conversation. So, who would like to start with the, with the questions? Yes, lady at the back. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much for that. My name is Mansoor Ahmed. I'm a local energy and economic policy student. Um, many questions, but combine it to two. Uh, first of all, in the UK, what uh, incentives is the government uh, putting in place to grow bioenergy feedstock? And secondly, there was a report by Chatham House last year which mentioned that in order to um, proceed with the EU 2020 pathway, in particular the RTFO uh, requirements, it's going to cost the UK and the taxpayer or motorists two billion pounds up to that period. And implying that it's quite a costly process and commercially not very viable. So keep on your thoughts on that as well. Uh, the first question, which is about growing feedstock in the UK, what, what are the incentives? Well, I mean, essentially this industry isn't really taking off. So um, I, I mentioned that the estimates vary, but the policy dictates that we need around 350 hectares to a million hectares of land dedicated to these crops to make some sort of impact. And I can tell you it's around 15,000 hectares at the moment. So whatever we've been doing isn't working. And much to... to, to um, well, great disappointment to report that there's more solar power deployed at the moment in farming systems. The acreage is bigger than for these second generation crops because of the way that the perverse incentives have worked. So in the UK there's been something called the Energy Crop Scheme which has paid farmers to plant the crop. That was probably wrong and, and, and we should have been subsidising farmers to harvest the crop 
because it, it, it hasn't really worked and now we don't even have that. We don't have that at the moment, it's closed and we're waiting to see what will take its place. And that there are various other incentives about capital, um, capital uh, investments, but essentially, you know, if you talk to the industry, the, the, the small industrialists will say, well, there's a lot of stop-start policy developments of the UK government, and that hasn't helped. And then the other incentives are contracts, which power stations such as Drax may start, uh, you know, bringing to the growers so that they have a better um, a reassurance that the market will continue. But you know, it's a very young industry, so uh, it's not great. That Chatham House report, so the second question then about the Chatham House report, um, I'd forgotten that actually, it was about how RTFO is deployed. Well, I mean, all I can say to that is that using green plants for liquid fuel isn't the first stop isn't necessarily the best use of green plants to decarbonise the energy sector if that's what our aim was. And so, um, you know, the policy before RTFO took off in Europe was always about heat and power. And so we had a bit of a, a fling with uh, liquid fuel and pro I'm sure those numbers are probably right, but we will have to pay for these things at some point. So, you know, I, I think it's very much up in the air. At the moment in Europe, the last I heard was that there's no agreement about whether we should use these things called I-look factors, so indirect land use change factors, to ramp up the greenhouse gas cost of the crop, of the biofuel chain. And so that's the next biggie. So it's really, we don't really know where RTFO is going at the moment. That's my perception. And there is nothing in the post 2020 package from the European Commission is on RTR on yeah. uh, biofuels. Uh, there's a question down here. A gentleman that you stole you stole <laughs> my point. Oh well I turned it. Go on make it anyway, make it more eloquently <laughs> Matt. Well, I, mean, I, was, yeah. I was just gonna make I'm sorry, uh, Matthew Ayla from the UK Energy Research Centre. Um, I was just gonna make the point that we don't have any stable policy framework going forward. Um, in this country post post this year looking at biofuels in, into the market. And we're also looking from a biomass to electricity point of view. We don't have stable mechanisms uh, like the energy crop scheme to actually incentivize it, which is why the market is, is pushing towards the, you know, the US um, and looking mm. to the US to get massive imports of wood. So what can we do to encourage more homegrown um, biomass for electricity and, uh, and looking at biofuel as well? Do we just need more? stable policy mechanisms or is it more than that? We certainly need that. Um, I mean, it, bizarrely, the, the letters, you know, the, the, the kick-off in the USA about the imports has, has sort of, it, it's generated a lot of analysis at DEC to, to look at what we're actually doing in the USA and whether that's sustainable. And it's sort of pushed the balance back towards we have to get our homegrown biomass in place. It can be sustainable, the carbon footprint looks great. So bizarrely it, it is, it's sort of swinging back but we have, we, we have no energy crop scheme. You know there's a lot of cultural, uh, the way farmers grow things, it, it, there's a lot of cultural stuff going on about wh what they should grow. They don't like investing in perennial energy crops, full stop. That hasn't changed for 20 years. They have to have bigger incentives to do that. Otherwise, this industry isn't going to happen. That's my prediction. For, from my perspective, it's, it's more damaging actually not having a policy rather than having a policy, even if it's not perfect. Mm. Um, so from my perspective, I'd rather see us having a policy rather than no policy. Yeah, agreed. Unless it's a perverse policy. Well, yes. Doing things you actually don't want. And I mean, that is obviously a possibility. Any other questions? Yes, we've got several questions. So we'll take this gentleman here and then we'll come across the other side. Uh, what's happening to algae? <laughs> Algae, ooh, that, it, yes, what can I say? I have to be very careful what I say here, but, um, well, you know, on that sort of research and development and deployment, sort of one to six scale, of course, it's way down, you know, in the sector at research level. So at the research level, there are some very exciting things happening in synthetic biology that, that could, it, it's becoming a little bit like, uh, 
fusion or you know potentially there are some great things happening there and we we get these sporadic reports in science and nature about discoveries that have been made it's very much down at that level um, on the one hand so lots of interesting discoveries about the you know the proteins that control light interception and whether or not we can make more efficient light interception uh, and then the way we make lipids in the system lots of interesting biology but then the big bottleneck is about scale up as well and I see a lot of rubbish research in that area to be honest and you know the, the scale up still very hard it's not something I keep in touch with but a lot of companies come into the, they seem to come into the marketplace and then they close very quickly you know so they take a look at it but it, it, it still isn't taking off I haven't seen many effective systems can't even decide on the system whether it's open raceways or these closed bioreactors as soon as you put artificial light into that system it becomes non-viable from the, fo the energy footprint so I guess it's a lot of research going on if we find the super strain if we can use second generation genomics to find wonderful things that we didn't have before or use synthetic bio, bio that might provide provide that step change. Certainly the research is not going to go away. That's my feeling. It's increasing if anything. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, earlier in your presentation you seemed to indicate that the SRF um, willow was, was the most beneficial. And then subsequently, there, there seems to be some other research that seems to favor the SRC um, and the, the other type. Um, yeah, I don't well, I mean, you're right, because for 20 years we've been working on SRC, on coppice, because the belief system is that that's, that's the best thing. And it's partly that it might be an acceptable thing for farmers to grow. It looks a bit more like an arable crop than a tree. Uh, but the results that are coming out for short rotation forestry have sort of caught us on the back foot, really. That if you took a blank sheet of paper and said, well, actually, how can we get the best biomass out of that, that one kilometre of land? You probably wouldn't choose coppice willow selected from northern climates in Sweden with you know all we know about climate change but the trouble is once the oil tanker is on its way it's quite difficult to to get it to change course and so that research on big trees is just starting to bubble up and we will continue to push it because it looks exciting so we're in a sort of transition and, and getting policy makers to accept some of those things is quite hard actually uh, DEFRA dabbled with eucalyptus let's grow eucalyptus trees all over the country but after they died for the third time in sort of North Yorkshire and Scotland we've given up on those now but there are lots of other options so so yeah you're right we're sort of in transition maybe I'll come back in 10 years and have the answer <laughs> You mentioned how um, solar appeared um, inferior to uh, biomass in the country. Oh no, I don't. I don't. No, no, I don't think so. I mean, well, you know, it's very heavily incentivised. Has been in the recent past, and so um, we've seen it deployed a lot in agricultural systems. So there are the, a lot of solar with grazing. That's sort of a, a very weird land use that we don't know anything about but the farmers have just gone and deployed it and and you know that's working they're supplying to the grid so who knows were, were, were you implying i think what this gentleman yeah. may be getting at is were you implying that the energy yield ah. on the solar panel however many kilowatt hours it is on a given piece of land would be less than if you were to plant one of these short rotation coppices or forestry or whatever systems. I mean, has that come That's a really interesting question. I shall go away and have a think about doing that. So I don't think we have those numbers sort of really at the moment. That's a really good question. Mm. Dexter's consulting on cutting those subsidies for those big fields. Yes. Systems. That's yeah. Gentlemen here. Perhaps, sorry, I'm going to talk about renewable energy consultant that I work on synthetic liquid fuels ah. from water and carbon dioxide so that goes exactly to this. 
the, the, talking about counterfactuals, the chief problem, of course, with bio is that the conversion efficiency from solar energy is terrible. It's less than 1%. Whereas solar panels now, I don't know if you saw recently, Panasonic have announced greater than 25% conversion efficiency panel. And that is really the issue with bio. That is whether it's worth the candle on land to grow biomass. The good thing about it is it sucks carbon dioxide out of the air. And the question is, and I'm glad you introduced the Kerry Institute letter, which is, I, I hope, going to spark a lot of, of a discussion mm. about standing forest. If you grew a forest, you shouldn't leave it there. You shouldn't burn it. And that's the essence of what the Americans are talking about when we're doing it with drags. We, we can, our conversion efficiency from solar panels is so good that we have to think very carefully about using land to grow biomass on monocultures. Well, I think, I mean, the conversion efficiency, you know, with solely, if you, if you consider the whole chain, the production costs and, you know, where your raw materials are coming from, there are some issues about that. But, yeah, fine. Green plants are relatively inefficient. They have low efficiencies. But that's not to say that we can't sort of ramp that up. I mean, Bill Gates has just invested a large sum of money to a consortium to look at exactly that. So, um, you know, this second generation sort of genomic biology is in its infancy. It's prob, you know, if I, I could predict, I'd probably say in 20 years those efficiencies might have gone up. But the question I would say to you is how many other ecosystem services are your solar panels delivering to the environment? Whereas, you know, these bioenergy systems, they can have a good carbon footprint, they're biodiverse, they improve the landscape, or they, they, they provide pollinator services. The world is stretched for pollinators. We're losing our pollinators probably because of pesticides. Here's a system that can increase pollination. So, you know, you have to look at the sort of whole system and probably we need a portfolio. So why not grow some more standing forest? Standing forest, so standing forest, standing forests do not continue to soak up carbon. That's a myth. Standing forests, they're born, they live and they die and they give that carbon back to the environment. That's the way the global carbon cycle works. The rotation rate is very long. Right, but we've manipulated, yeah, so, you know, we can manipulate it. Yes. Uh, yeah. This sounds like yeah. a discussion for upstairs. Um, <laughs> uh, moving towards the upstairs uh, segment of the evening. There's a lady there. Hi, I'm Rachel Brooks from the Project Student of Healing. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I'm um, almost leading on from this discussion. I'm um, wondering if you can comment on a recent study um, from the US about the use of blood residues uh, for biofuel since uh, this has obviously been thrown around a lot as a, a kind of interesting source of biomass. Um, and my second one is, is more concerning uh, pretreatment. Um, and in, in the planning of these studies, which is it's great to see this is happening, for references for stuff like this is really hard. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, I noticed that you said this, that uh, crops like birch uh, take too long for these studies to really continue. Um, and yet, on, in terms of pretreatment, these are really interesting ones in terms of maximizing yields of uh, cellulose, semi cellulose, and so these are the studies that are really good. So on the corn stovers, so using the byproducts of corn, so I mean that's a great resource. I, I remember being in the States in a meeting in 2007 where we were discussing the corn stover. So this is the piece of the corn and the, the lignocellulosic which is left over. But of course at that stage it was much easier to just get the sugar out of the, the yellow bits of the sweet corn. So of course it's an easy win and that's where commerce will go. So they've gone for the easy wins. A little bit like sugar cane. But now there's a big push to make these lignocellulosic refineries in Brazil for example. So to take the raw biomass, the byproduct the lignocellulosics and to convert those. If we can do that, I mean I haven't checked in the US recently but I seem to recall there's something quite close to being commercial. Of course once you get, you know, using multiple parts of the crop in that way, that's the win-win situation because you're using the waste essentially, what we call waste at the moment, and the, the crop. 
So, you know, bringing those two together is very good, but it, it's, not an I it's not an easy win. Because it's not an easy win, because it needs a lot of enzymes, it's very tough matter, exactly. But that doesn't mean the LCA will stay there. You know, these things can change when the processing improves, basically. So we'll have to use that waste. We can't not use that waste, essentially. So what was your second question about? Um, that was just, um, I think it's a long question, but maybe a quick answer about um, in terms of planning of the studies. Oh, well, I mean, that's particularly for the UK, it's just that some of those species are not as important. They're just not grown enough to be really considered, so they drop off the analysis quite quickly. But in, in Scandinavia, for example, birch is much more important, and the sort of biorefineries that are being looked at are looking at those more northerly tree types and conifers as well to process in, in, in real biorefineries. So there are a couple of projects going on there. They're just not that relevant to the UK. Okay, I think I saw one more question and then we're going to back up. Oh, I'm not very good on salt water on these algal systems, but um, they do exist and, and in the UK there's quite a bit of work on macro algae, basically seaweed, strong across wind turbines essentially where you make these fields, energy fields that are using seaweed as well as wave and wind and tidal power offshore. So that looks pretty exciting and the Scottish Marine Organisation are doing quite a bit of work on investigating that. So I'm going to wrap up just by asking you one question of my own. Um, I remember a presentation by one of your PhD students some years ago, which um, was showing the diversity of results from the, the life cycle analyses that uh, yeah. she was studying, which showed this enormous yeah. diversity. And, and I wouldn't have known where to put the, you know, yeah. the answer because yeah. they seemed to be all over the place. The single study you've done on carbon, under the carbo crop thing, with these yeah. different areas in the UK, yeah. have given you, seem to have given you some sort of pretty interesting and fairly robust results. I mean, what's their generalizability, if you like? I mean, can we now say, problem solved, we can get, plug those numbers into the life cycle inventories, and when people come to do PhDs on life cycle analysis and biofuels in the future, they won't get this huge range? Or do they depend very much on the places that you chose, the climate, the climatic conditions when the crops were growing, blah, blah, all that stuff? I mean, just talk a little bit about how that has affected so, so these life cycle analyses, you're right that when we did a sort of meta-analysis and broke them down and looked at them in a great amount of detail, and lots of other people have done this, that the, the range is absolutely enormous. But what we can say now is that some generalizations have started to come out. Even within those ranges, we understand that you know, some life cycles are much worse. So bioethanol, for example, uh, biodiesel, than others, so woody biomass to anything is pretty much better than the others. So we have some sort of error bars on them, if you like, which are general. They're generally where they tend to scope. And so many studies have come out with the same sorts of um, generalizations that we can have some confidence in those. The empirical data are starting to sit in those as we would imagine, so they are becoming robust. But what is also becoming apparent is that we're writing a paper at the moment and it's called something like the six things you need to know. And there are some things that just turn that on, on you know, they turn it on a knife essentially. One is crop management and fertilization, for example, how you manage the crop, that can have a big impact. And then another is what you do with co-products and, and, and so on. So within those caveats, we know a lot more, they've become more robust and we can identify these good and poor chains and we're, we're addressing the gaps. So I'd say we'd moved on quite a bit, but those error bars still, they are there. They're the real errors. Okay, Gail, thank you very much. Thanks.